our attention to the biblical text, we're going to come from the book of Isaiah, chapter number 58, verse uh, number 13. Uh, As you know, we have been speaking for this past uh, month or so as we've introduced uh, our annual consecration. I think we have one more week left, and I hope that you all have joined in the consecration. I know for many of us, we may not always understand or appreciate why consecrations are important. Doesn't it feel like it's a relic of the past? But I want you to know that there's something powerful about uh, putting your body through a disciplined rigor around uh, abstention from many things, whether it is food, whether it is alcohol or drugs or uh, any other forms of self-medication, what a consecration allows us to do is to prioritize uh, the spiritual well-being of our person. How many of you know that there's more to you than just your appetites and your uh, desires and those cravings that you have? But there's something inside of you that God has placed and that God wants to cultivate with our partnership. And so the consecration every year, it allows us to ensure that we are starting our year off centering ourselves in the will of God. Uh, Some of you may say, well, Pastor Mike, I I didn't even know we're doing a consecration or I tried the consecration. I just kept messing up or, you know, them donuts, them them, them chicken wings, uh, that that porterhouse steak. Amen. Uh, The cupcakes, praise God. The, 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 the slurpees, all of that stuff, it was just too much for me, and I just had to succumb. Well, I want you to know it's not too late. Come on, put in the chat, it's not too late for you to consecrate. Amen. It's not too late for you to consecrate. Join us one more week. The Scripture tells a story, Jesus tells a story of how uh, they put out a call to uh, the workforce, and they said, come and, and, and help us with this harvest. We have so many, so many uh, crops that we need to harvest for the good of the community. And, and they, 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 they put out a call, and the early morning workers came, and they still found there were not enough workers. And then at noontime, Jesus said, put out another call, and more workers came. Still were not enough workers. In the evening time, they put out another call, and more workers came, and there still were not enough workers. It was one hour before quitting time, and they still put out another call, and more workers came, and the the, the hirer said, listen, I'm going to give everybody the same pay. I want you to know that I hear God just continuing to remind us that it's not when you join, it's just if you join. I want you to join the consecration. Help us uh, get ourselves as a church, a family, a congregation, a people, a community. Uh, help us to get ourselves in the way of God's blessing, the way of God's plans, the way of God's purposes. Consecration will help us do that. No meats, no sweets. It's a Daniel fast. Load up on vegetables, load up on prayer, load up on study, load up on service, load up on doing things that put you at rest with God. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today, that we want to be uh, a people who are able to rest in life. Amen. Rest in life life. Amen. Listen, uh, let's let's turn our attention to the scriptures uh, then. Uh, Isaiah chapter 58 is where we're going to spend our time. And uh, I love the book of Isaiah, particularly these passages, because they are speaking to a people who are people of the covenant who find themselves in exile, in a very strange and unfamiliar place. Uh, they attribute their their place in history, their bondage, their exile to them not fulfilling their covenant responsibilities. And so the prophets are always uh, uh, brought back to the people to help remind them of their covenant responsibilities. And in this particular passage, we do see uh, them uh, being reminded of what would happen if they fell back into the plan of God, the best that God has planned for them. And so Isaiah chapter 58 uh, is is one of these passages that talk a lot about fasting, talks a lot about the ability to align oneself with the way of God, with the truth of God, with the, the principles of God, and that when one does that, one unlocks a certain way of life that causes the best possible life to emerge. And so Isaiah 58, we're picking it up in the middle of this chapter, uh, verse number 13. I'm only going to read two verses, so come on and read with us. The scripture says it like this, If you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please, 
on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Come on, let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So for a few moments, we're just going to talk about a simple, simple title, simple message uh, called Give It a Rest. Amen. Give it a rest. Give it a rest rest. Amen. Uh, Come on, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to say thank you, Lord, for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and cause us, Lord God, to experience the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy. Hide me behind your cross. This is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Amen and amen. Come on, just put it in the chat. Give it a rest. Give it a rest. Give it a rest. Amen. Give it a rest. Now, you know, many of us, I think, can appreciate that the culture in which we live is prone to busyness. Uh, the, The way of life that we have been socialized, particularly we who live in the Bay Area, the cost of living is is quite exorbitant. It is unreasonable. One could even say it is indeed a form of structural evil and wickedness in that we can live in the most wealthy region, some would even say, of the world and still find ourselves a slave to time. That in order for us to even make our way, uh, we must have a way of life that forces us to literally work ourselves into exhaustion. And I want you to know, child of God, that it is never the will of God for you and I to work ourselves into exhaustion. Now, it is true over time, uh, the systems of this world, the, the hierarchies, the powers Uh, the scarcity that has too often uh, beleaguered a world created with abundance has forced so many to have to work from sunup to sundown and have normalized that work in a way that causes people to be described as lazy if they do not literally work so hard that their heart bursts, that their, their bodies give out, that their minds become overwhelmed with illness and trauma because of the physical limitations being overran by the need to produce. I'm well aware that even many of us, perhaps in our congregation, work two or three or four jobs because our systems, uh, the rent is too high, the School requires us to pay tuition so we can give our kids the best possible education uh, that they or we can afford. Uh, our, our car notes, our, our, our Louis Vuitton red bottoms. Any of y'all wear them joints? Praise God. I don't know. Your uh, uh, yo, 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 yo designer Nike shoes that cost you $350 to wear outside so dirt can get all on them. Somebody say amen. Amen. You know, all of these things, these demands can often compel us to use our limited time in a way that literally robs us of life. But I want you to know, child of God, that there is another way of living that does not require you to lose your life in time. But as a matter of fact, it invites us to find our lives in the time that is defined as rest. Yes, indeed, we have made this year's uh, 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 theme and call to, to, to being 
related around refreshing, a year, a season of refreshing. Why? Because it is without a doubt that COVID-19 for the last couple years have literally robbed many of us of years of of, of wages, of loved ones, of our own sense of well-being. Uh, the isolation has worn on us, and, and we are still being called out into the world to produce and to create and to, to stay in the rat race while uh, a more reasonable invitation by God may be to find rest in a time of illness. I want you to know, child of God, that uh, the, the idea of finding rest is a theologically rich theme throughout not just our tradition as followers of Jesus, but also in the biblical text. We find this theme of rest uh, that from the beginning of the scriptural text all the way to the end, that when God creates in the beginning. Amen. The scripture uh, gives us a narrative and a description of creation that God, out of God's abundance, begins to produce and to carve out of nothingness something that becomes all of us, creation. But at the end of God's work, the scripture says, and I'm going to read a couple background scriptures for you and I, just so you can understand that this idea of rest has a theological construction that is very different than the idea of rest that even we who are kind of in movement spaces, you know, everybody start talking about self-care. I need to have self-care. And I, I, I'm glad that we're having that conversation. But I want to help you to understand that there is a deeper, more rewarding way of pausing our lives than just having a time of self-care. That rest theologically is about you and I moving into a place and a space where God lives and dwells. Ooh, Jesus, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm interested in, in finding the secret place where God dwells. In the business of all of my life, in the challenges of all of my struggles, I want God to be at an address where I can regularly show up. And I can find my Sabbath rest. Oh, you ought to put that in the chat today and just tell somebody, I need the address for my Sabbath. Amen. I need the address for my Sabbath. I refuse to stay at the address of this world that would love to exhaust me to the point of death and then plug somebody in when I'm gone. No, if, 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 if I need a break, amen, I'm going to go to the address of Sabbath. And here we find in Genesis chapter number two, verse three, the scripture says, then God blessed the seventh day and God made it holy because on the seventh day, God rested from all the work of creating that God had done. That God creates for a season and then God carves out time in God's creative work. God carves out time for God to rest. I mean, I'm going to ask you a provocative question here. Uh, if, if the all-powerful and almighty God needs to carve out time for God to rest, why do you believe ooh, that you don't need to carve out time for you to rest? I mean, could it be that the God who created us put within our DNA the need for rest. Because if I and we are created in the image of God, if uh, the thumbprint of God on our lives reflects the divine uh, 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 framework and infrastructure that has been literally downloaded into our being, you must rest if God must rest. Uh, you ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got to take a rest. If God has the rest, then who am I to think I don't need no rest? And so God, because God was aware that the human predilection is to continue to move without structuring rest, God makes rest a part of the covenant 
that he makes with the children of Israel. When God gives them the Torah, the Ten Commandments, God gives them all of these commands. Don't have idols. Don't uh, uh, kill one another. Don't lie. Don't, don't do all these things. And in that list, God also tells them in uh, Exodus chapter 20, we have find this captured. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work. But on the seventh day, it is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But God rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And I am the Lord, your God. Follow my decrees. Be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbaths holy that they may be a sign between us. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God. Sabbath, Sabbath, the idea that God directed the children of Israel to have a rhythm of rest. Now, it is so important for you and I to appreciate that although we may not necessarily uh, subscribe in a literalistic sense to every dot and tittle in Scripture, uh, and I know some of us who are quite conservative or fundamentalists think we do, but I guarantee you, you don't. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Because the lie of fundamentalism is to make you think you can keep every law perfect through your own strength. But the, 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 the truth of the matter is that it is only by the grace of God can we indeed be free enough to do anything that God requires of us. That grace, the gift, the divine power of God must always be the empowering agent, listen, to even labor to rest. How many of you know it's going to take the power of God for you to convince yourself what we just read in this scripture, that in order for you to keep the Sabbath day holy, I must make a commitment between myself and God that everything that I believe is requiring of my consistent 24-hour a day, seven uh, days a week, 365 days a year attention. God, I make a commitment that at least one day a week, I'm going to give you the chance to be God without my input. How I many know that's an act of faith, amen? You ought to put it in the chat. I, I, I want that faith, amen? But I'm telling you, your pastor don't even got that kind of discipline just yet. Amen. I thank God for people like Pastor Don and others who, who continuously tell me, Mike, you need to take a Sabbath. You need to rest. You need to do something that causes your mind and your body and your spirit an opportunity to recharge. And here in the text, we find that it is so important for us to know that even though we may seek to do the good, sometimes even in our seeking, it can become another form of bondage. Because here we find that even those who are most zealous to keep the law, to keep the Torah, to keep the Sabbath, they were not always clear what it meant to rest. And so the Talmud and many uh, scribes and, and, and rabbis of their day, uh, they had to create these lists to help people be clear about what it meant to rest on the Sabbath. And that list became so exhaustive that eventually it became a source of literal bondage, right? Meaning that people were not able to fully enter into a place of appreciation for rest. They were trying to find out ways to keep the Sabbath while not resting. <laughs> Amen. And, 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 I, and I, 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 I found this wonderful, wonderful table. It's called the Melikos table. It comes out of the Talmud, and it lists 39 things that, that, that you have to not do on the Sabbath in order to maintain your rest. And I don't know if it's on the screen, but I'm just going to read them real quick so you can see how literally the Sabbath was given as an opportunity to rest. But when you started to go through all the laundry list of things you couldn't do in order to rest, you found yourself so bound by trying not to work that you literally had to work yourself to rest. 
In order for them to keep the, 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 the Sabbath, they could not carry things over a certain weight. They could not burn things. They could not extinguish things. They couldn't finish uh, projects. They couldn't write. They couldn't erase. They couldn't cook. They couldn't wash. So they couldn't tear things, knotting things, untying things. They couldn't shape things. They couldn't plow. They couldn't plant. They couldn't reap. They couldn't harvest. They couldn't thresh, winnow. They couldn't select things. They couldn't sift. They couldn't grind. They couldn't knead things. They couldn't uh, comb things. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Folks had all kind of wild hair on the Sabbath, it seems. Amen. They couldn't spin things. They couldn't dye things. They couldn't chain stitch. They couldn't warp and weave and unravel and build and demolish. They couldn't trap things. They couldn't shear things. They couldn't slaughter things. They couldn't skin things. They couldn't tan things. They couldn't smooth things. They couldn't mark things. It was like you literally had to make sure that on the day of Sabbath you were not violating these admonitions. And I have found over time that sometimes we can allow an admonition to become a command. We can, uh, we, can, we can have a guide become a cage for some. We can offer some of our own contextual preferences and make them a source of literal bondage for others. I mean, this is what Jesus says when he was dealing with uh, the, the woman that he healed on the Sabbath in the book of Mark, chapter number two uh, through 23, I believe. Uh, he says that on the Sabbath, Jesus went to the, the temple, I believe. And, and as his disciples walked along the way, they began to pick some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to them, look. Why are you picking grain on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered uh, to them, listen, uh, you think that the Sabbath was made for, for you, but I want you to know that the Sabbath was made. Oh, I'm sorry. Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man, not men for the Sabbath, which means, child of God, that when anything that has been given to us by God as a gift begins to create bondage for us, then it is worthy of being reconsidered. And this is why I love Augustine's uh, refrain, uh, the North African uh, church father, St. Augustine. He says it like this, that our hearts were made for yourself, O God, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. God, we have been created for you. We've not been created for uh, this economy, for this country, uh, for your race, your gender, your, your, your orientation, for your favorite football team. Go Niners, by the way. Somebody say amen. Uh, we have not been created for all of these descriptions of who we are. We literally have been created for God's purposes. And all of these other things, they have their place, and they are not uh, uh, to be stigmatized. They are not uh, to be minimized. They are not to uh, reduce or limit or, or, or perhaps even problematize your humanity. But they are to always be put under the, 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 the authority of a great and gracious God who invites our whole lives to literally be a liturgical exercise, an exercise of worship, an exercise of giving glory to God. And when my life is seen as a perpetual worship song, as a perpetual liturgy, as a unending melody of praise to God, it is that act in and of itself, that discipline of seeing our lives as a gift to God that unlocks the address of where we find rest, even amidst the schedule of our busyness. I want you to think about this for a few moments, child of God. What would it mean for you to give it a rest? All of these things in your life, that often creates such busyness that you are not able to find the address of Sabbath 
the address of rest in your life. Jesus reminds us that in order for the true Sabbath to be realized in our lives, we must join God's work of redemption. We must relieve the burdens of the oppressed. We must do these activities that uh, differentiate themselves from the kind of work in the world that is always about producing and propping up someone else's project. I want you to know that the project of God in the world does not require your exhaustion because God's project, whether it's taking care of your family, whether it's loving on yourself, whether it's doing justice in the community, whether it's taking care of the gifts and stewarding that which given you, all of that should be seen as a part of God's project in the world. And God will never give you an assignment that requires your exhaustion in order for it to be completed. God will always invite you to take a Sabbath. God will always invite you to sit down and rest and find the secret place, the address, the location where God is. Why? Because when I provide sacred space for the divine to work, it is in that moment that I begin to see that rest is not about my paralysis. It is not about my laziness. It is about my location in God. Uh, so let me give you a couple quick points here as we, as we hasten to a conclusion today. The first thing I want you to realize, child of God, is you, we must rest so God can work. Come on, come on, say that. I must rest so God can work. I must rest so God can work. Sometimes we are so busy working, <laughs> that we outwork God. Woo, Lord, have mercy. We outwork God. And how many of you know, when you outwork God, you will always have a lesser outcome. When you are working harder than God is on that which concerns you, you are not creating space for God to work in your life. Resting then, it means that you cease from certain activities. Why? So you can have communion with God. While you have communion with God, it may create an absence from your work. But I have found, Lord have mercy, that the absence, my absence from work often creates space for God to make the difference. Uh-huh. My absence from work can create space for God to make a difference. I want to appreciate Brother Anthony, who's been working me out, y'all, every day or three days out the week. It feel like every day, but it is every day. I want you to understand why. Amen, Brother Anthony, amen, he's a, a mean, hard taskmaster. Man, he makes me work, uh, I think he said there's 600 muscles in my body, and I think I've only worked 10 of them over the course of my life. And man, so I'm working on all these different muscles, and, and he's telling me, you know, uh, what's happening is your, your body, it, your muscles are literally tearing apart because you're so atrophied, McBride, <laughs> praise God. You, you, you got so, 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 many, so many muscles in your body that have not yet to be used. And so when you work these muscles out, on the day you don't work, listen to this, your body and your muscles and your, 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 uh, uh, your, 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 oh man, what am I trying to say? Uh, the, the part of your body that, that, that continues to burn fat and, 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 and continues to uh, uh, heal itself, that is working when you're not working. I begin to think about that thing. I says, you mean to tell me that on the days when I'm working out and I'm struggling and I'm hollering and sweat is bursting out of my pores and I'm fatigued to the point of, of, of being close to death and I, I'm working out and I'm realizing I'm a shell of a man. You mean all of that experience, it, it allows my body to keep working even when I don't work. That the absence of me working out allows the body to keep working on its own. 
I want you to know, child of God, that sometimes you and I can be working so hard on something that we literally are elbowing God out. Our doubt, our fears, our anxieties are elbowing God out of the very thing we know only God can solve. But could you imagine that if you rested, you ceased to work on those things, not as a form of inactivity, but you sought out the address where God is. And you said, God, I don't want to take up so much workspace in my life that I don't create absence for you to work. That's my first question for you today. Are you taking up so much space in your work, in your life, in your vocation, in the things that concern you? Are you working so hard to dot every I and across every T that you don't create some moments of absence that literally while you are seeking out your rest in God, you're giving God space to keep working on your behalf when you're not there. I mean, what are the places in our lives that you need God to work when you're not there? God, when my kids are at school, I need you to work. Lord have mercy. Well, what, 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 while I'm, 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 I'm trying to figure out this stuff on my job, I need you to work. While my relationships are, are transitioning and changing and, and going through hardships and struggles, I need you to work. While my health is failing, God, I need you to work because I'm going to take a rest from trying to solve all of these problems through my own strength. Oh, come on, you ought to put that in the chat and just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest so God can work. I'm going to rest so God can work. The second thing that I, I think we ought to be mindful of when we think about rest is that rest redeems time. Come on, come on, put that in the chat. Rest redeems time. It is important for you and I to appreciate, child of God, that, again, time in this capitalistic culture will turn you and I into nothing more than producers, nothing more than a means of production. But I want you to know that God's invitation to take Sabbath in the culture of capitalistic production means that you are literally taking back the time that the world has hijacked from your life. You are literally saying to the world that I will not be a slave to your production. Amen. We saw the Matrix, amen, and they, they did a little bit of reboot, and it was all right, you know, but the theme was still the same, that, that people in the Matrix did not even know that the machines had made them nothing more than a source of energy. They were literally sucking all of the life force and the energy out of these human beings. And the human beings did not even know it because they were plugged into the matrix that had, in all intents and purposes, created such an illusion for them that unless they were set free, they never would have known that they were indeed in bondage. I want you to know, child of God, that the Sabbath and the rest, uh, this as a perpetual way to structure into your life time to rest. It helps you to redeem time. It helps you to, to, to remind your body and your mind and your heart. It helps you to remind the people you're around, your work life, your business life, this company you're starting, your education. It helps you to remind yourself that I will not be bound by the rhythms of time in a death-dealing world. But I'm going to realize that when I rest, I'm redeeming time. I'm taking time back, and I'm putting time back into the hands of the Almighty God. I'm allowing time to now become something that allows God to work on me. Amen. Not just the things that I'm concerned about, but now I realize that, God, I need to move from being the producer to now I need to actually be the production. 
I need to be the thing that God is pouring into, that God is working on. I need to pour into myself love. I need to pour into myself peace and power and strength. I need to pour into myself the kinds of things that cause me to see beauty in the world, to find light in the midst of gloom, to find hope in the midst of despair, the, the ability to create rest in your schedule allows you to put a pause on the rat race that is time in this world. Oh yes, child of God, you and I must continue to redeem the time by resting. So my question to you, are you bound by the timing of this world? Are you structuring time in your life to be the object to be worked on by God rather than the one producing things for this world? Can you see yourself that, Lord, I need to make a pivot. I need to make a switch. I need to make a bit of a radical disruption in the way time posits me in the world as Nothing more than a producer. No, God, I need to be worked on. I need to create time in my life to find the secret place that then allows me to be redirected to the ways in which I can indeed find beauty in the world, healing in the world, hope in the world, love in the world. What are practices that you can do this week that can help you to build and structure time into your schedule. I know some of you are like, Pastor Mike, you just don't know my schedule. Listen, I do know your schedule. <laughs> hey, man, it's busy like mine. But what does it mean for you to wake up maybe an hour earlier a day or turn off the TV or go outside and walk along the marina? What does it mean rather than on your lunch break talking to your gossiping friend or something, looking at the, 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 the tabloids or, or scrolling through Twitter and Instagram. What does it mean? Rather you doing all that, you say, I'm going to build into my life, my daily life time. What does it mean for you to take one day out the week and say, I am going to do something for me that reflects God's desire for me to rest and recharge? It is in these actions that the final point becomes so clear, particularly from the biblical text. The biblical text says that it is in this place of Sabbath that you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride in triumph on the heights of the land. I found that, that language to be so powerful. That rest creates space for us to find joy. Rest creates space for us to find joy. Think about this. After God did all that God did creating, God said, I'm going to rest. Why do you think God rested? Was God tired? I don't think God was tired. Was God exhausted? I don't think God was exhausted. I think God wanted to reflect on what God had done. I think that God in God's rest was able to really see that everything God did was good. Everything God created was good. And the goodness is what creates joy. Without rest, you can't reflect. Without rest, you can't evaluate. Without rest, you can't find the joy in not only the work of your hands, but in the miracles God does through your rest. Without rest, it's hard to find the places where you can see God working even in your absence. Without rest, life will just come at you hot and fast without any opportunity for you to literally behold the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. 
I believe that God is calling some of us into a time of rest. The consecration is an opportunity to rest from unhealthy behaviors. It don't mean you're starving yourself now. See, consecration is an example of rest from unhealthy ways of living. And then you must rest, labor to find rest in healthy living. The consecration is an opportunity for you to cease from practices that suck your spirit dry. Not because you don't do spiritual things during the consecration, but it is an opportunity then for you to engage in behavior that creates rest in your spirit. Give it a rest. All these things in your life that keep you from taking Sabbath, give it a rest. Heartache, give it a rest. Exhaustion, give it a rest. Schedules packed from sunup to sundown, Sunday through Saturday, give it a rest. Busyness that keeps you from taking care of yourself. Give it a rest. And as you give it a rest, you will find the key that unlocks the address to the rest of God. That is Sabbath. God, we want to say thank you. Thank you because our hearts will never be at rest until they find their rest in you. So God, we reach for your rest. We eschew, we cast aside all of those things, God, that keep us from finding rest in you, God. We know that we must go to work and show up and do that which affords us a livelihood, but God, we must not feel the requirement to be so exhausted that it robs us of our rest. So God, I pray for the rest of your people. I pray for the rest of their souls. I pray for the rest of their minds and their spirit, their families, their relationships. I pray for Sabbath, Lord God, to be seen as a holy act, Lord God, of surrender. It's an act of trust. It's an act that says, God, you can do more with one day than I can do with six. And so, therefore, I will rest. I will not allow this capitalistic economy and culture to drive me to the place where I can't take a break in a season of reprieve, but I will rest. And in the rest, God, I will find life. I will find healing. I will find refreshing. So God, in our rest, heal us from all hurt, from all trauma, from all pain. Heal us from the confusion that afflicts our minds. Heal us, Lord God, from those things that keep us in bondage. And we will, God, as we rest, emerge with a consciousness of a lifestyle of worship, of living that brings glory to you in our words, in our acts, in the way we treat one another, in the way we treat ourselves, in the way we respond to our neighbor, our loved one. We will emerge from our rest and Sabbath with joy, with clarity, with strength, with renewed commitments to steward that which you've placed in our hands. And beyond, Lord God, just the Sabbath, I pray for rest for our weary souls. God, all who are weary and heavy laden, Jesus, you said that we should come to you, exchange our yokes, For your yokes, for your yoke is easy and your burden is light. So God, those who are not followers of you, those who are still trying to seek or renew their faith in you, God, I pray that they, God, will find rest in your salvation. I pray, God, that they will find rest in the work that you have done to redeem all humanity 
Save us. Wash away our sins. Cleanse us through the baptism of water and spirit. Fill us with the power of your Holy Ghost that gives us power to tread on the heads of serpents and, and, and power to speak with new tongues and languages, Lord God, that, that can proclaim the good news. Power to call fire from heaven. Give us what we need through the salvific work you've done. So we will always be at rest with you. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, people of the way. We love you with the love of the Lord. This week, come on, I challenge you. Give it a rest.